So there are many different reasons why a parent might want to transfer a house to a child. It might be their residence and they're just sick of taking care of it or maybe their child lives with them and they want to transfer it to the child so the child can take over paying the property taxes or maybe they're making a gift to the child. I know here in the Bay Area it's super expensive to buy property so maybe they want to help out. So that can be a really wonderful gift to make to the child. Say, here you go, here's a house. A starter house that you can start in. But there's actually some pretty big problems that can come up if you own a house and then you transfer it to somebody else. There's three tax reasons why I don't think this is often a good idea. And before I dive into them, I just want to do a little disclaimer. If you have this particular situation and you're looking to transfer, I suggest you meet with a real estate attorney because they know all the ins and outs. I'm just intending this as a general overview of the different things you might run into. Okay, so the first big issue specific to California are California property taxes. As many of you know, Prop 13 keeps the property tax assessment, what you have to pay every year for property taxes, pretty low once you've bought a property. They can't increase it according to the fair market value like they do in many other states. Instead, it can only be increased by a small percentage. So that means that a lot of people bought their houses in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and those houses have really increased in value, but they're still paying, paying low property taxes. Well, in that case, what if you transfer your property from you to your child? Well, we used to have this thing called Proposition 58, a lot of propositions, right? Where you could transfer your residence from you to your child and the whole residence transfers at the low property tax assessment. You can also transfer non-residents properties to your child of up to a million dollars of total assessed value. Okay, so this was a big opportunity to transfer, but Proposition 19 changed all this. This was passed in February of 2021 and this is what happened. So as I was mentioning, before Proposition 19, you can have non-residents of up to $1 million in assessed value passed along to the child with no reassessment and a residence of any value passed along to the child with no reassessment. Okay, this is really beneficial because, for example, if you have a house that's worth now $3 million but you bought it for $100,000, you're really paying just a tiny little bit of property taxes. But if it was reassessed to the value at $3 million, you'd be paying, what, $30,000 a year in property taxes? So that's a huge jump. Right, but Prop 19, this is what it did. There, there are some benefits of Prop 19, and, and I do go into it in a different video, but I do want to really highlight what happened that's not beneficial to most of my clients, okay? So after Prop 19, what happened is when you have a residence, only the first million dollars of the increase in value is free from reassessment and that only applies if the child who inherits the property actually moves into the property themselves and makes it their own residence all right so both things have to happen and so that's very very limited anything above the one million dollars in, in increase in value is still reassessed and if the child doesn't move into the property and make it their own residence it's a full reassessment. Also, rental properties now are completely reassessed. So if you're thinking, hey, I'm just gonna pass along my residence to my kids now, no problem, they can take over paying the property taxes, well, their property taxes are going to be increased by a lot, okay? So a lot of times, you, you don't want to do this transfer early. So the second reason you should be cautious in transferring your property to your kids is because of capital gains tax. So you might be familiar with this type of tax, but let me just give you a, a quick example. So let's say you buy stock for a dollar, okay? And then the value, it, it does very well, and the value goes up to $10, and then you sell the stock. So you actually have to pay tax on the increase or the gain, that $9 gain. And in California, it turns out to be about 30%. So you're paying 30% tax on that increase, okay? So this is the same thing with your house. So for example, you bought your house for, and this happens all the time in the Bay Area. I mean, it's a crazy example, think about it. But you know, you buy your house for $100,000 a long time ago, and now it's worth $3 million. 
So if you sell your house, let's say you're a married couple and you sell your house, the first $500,000 of capital gains is, is a freebie. But the rest of it, you know, the other $2.4 million of gain, you'd have to pay taxes on that, which would be punishing, all right? But now let's say you buy the property, it goes up in value, and then one of you dies. As long as that's community property, it should get a full step up in the cost basis. Anything that you own at the time of your death gets a step up in cost basis. So that's really, really helpful. So that means if you bought it for $100,000 and it was worth $3 million and then your spouse just died, okay? The property is actually steps up to as if you bought it for $3 million. And so now you could sell it for $3 million and there's no capital gains tax at all. So this really provides an incentive for people to hold on to property with low basis. We call that a low cost basis and wait until somebody dies and then it, it gets the step up in cost basis. So if you recently had a step up in cost basis for your house, so you know that the cost basis is pretty high, then you might consider transferring the property to your child. But let's say you didn't get that step up, all right? And you bought the property for $100,000, it's worth $3 million, and then you say, okay, we're gonna give this property to our child. The child takes the property as if they bought the property for $100,000. So when the child sells it someday, they're going to have to pay that capital gains tax. Now, we, we call the capital gains tax a voluntary tax because you really don't pay it until you sell the property, but it's still kind of lurking in the background. We don't want you to have to pay capital gains tax in the future, or we don't want your child to. So that's another reason why I usually say, you know, a pause and see a real estate attorney before you transfer your house to your child. Okay, so the third type of tax that can be implicated by transferring a property to a child is estate taxes. So estate tax, sometimes it's called a death tax. This is a tax on your estate upon your death. Now, the nice thing is there's an exemption, all right? So now it, it's 2022 right now, the estate tax exemption is very high. It's $12.06 million. So if you have less than that amount, you're not going to have any estate taxes upon your death. So that's a little politician thing. They'll say, oh, everybody's gonna have to pay death taxes. No, there's, there's actually an exemption. But if you have a larger estate, you may have to pay estate taxes, actually not on the first death, but definitely on the second death if your estate is higher than the estate tax exemption. Now, one thing that we need to keep in mind is anything that you give away during your lifetime, there's several ways you can give it away and not have it recorded. Like for example, the first $16,000 of a gift to any number of people, as long as it's a completed gift, is a freebie. Okay, that's called your annual exclusion. You don't have to report it to the IRS, it's fine. But anything over that amount, let's say you gave $100,000 to your child, the first 16,000 is forgiven, but the next $84,000 has to be reported to the IRS on a gift tax return of Form 709. And then the IRS keeps a little ledger. I think of them, you know, like as a little bean counter in the back room and they say, all right, this person used up $84,000 of their $12.06 million of estate tax exemption. All right, so dollar for dollar, whatever you gift over that annual exclusion, and there's a few other ways to make gifts without having to report it to the IRS, but, but typically this is what happens. Dollar for dollar, it reduces your estate tax exemption. 2026, unless Congress does something to change it, the estate tax exemption is going to drop down to about half of what it is right now, about six or six and a half million dollars per person. So that means as a married couple, you can protect about 12 million but anything over that, you'll be taxed. So if you have a substantial estate and you say, oh, I know, I wanna give away this townhouse or this property to my child, please be aware that it's going to eat away dollar for dollar against your ultimate estate tax exemption. So at the time of your death, you'll have less of an exemption for passing along to your kids. Some people aren't aware that the gift tax exemption and the estate tax exemption are linked in that way. So for most of us, that the third point won't apply, but if it does apply, it can apply in a big way. There's other ways to gift properties to your children that have less of an effect perhaps on your state tax exemption, but I'm not, I'm not going into those. Those are really more 
high net worth planning. So now you have a better idea of some of the consequences of transferring real property from yourself to your child or to another loved one of the next generation. So again, please go see a real estate attorney, but I hope this has clarified things for you quite a bit. If this is interesting to you and you'd like to learn more about estate planning in general, I encourage you to watch my webinar on all things estate planning, which is available right down here. And I'll see you over there.